Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's show is the complete three-part interview we did with the Zombies, lead singer Colin Blondstone and keyboardist Rod Origin. Hope you like it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, the complete interview with the Zombies. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame. Today's guest is the great Zombies, Colin Blonstone and Rod Origin. Can't thank you guys enough for, for coming in. I've been a fan since I was 10. Oh, bless you. So, to this day, if uh, she's not there, comes on the radio, it never gets changed. It gets turned up. And, great, great. Uh, and so, and, and it, She's not tell her tell her no and and of course time of the season and I really liked I love you that was a right that should that should have been a big hit record I thought well, it radio was record. you know it was quite a big hit record but for a Canadian band called People oh really? and it was a B side for us but this other band uh, covered it yeah and and it was quite a big record number but three wasn't it I, I think it got to number yeah. three yeah. Oh, wow. But should have been a zombies hit. It yeah, I know. Yeah, we're all agreed on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, you're, you're an incredible songwriter as well as keyboard player. And, and, I, and I really don't know how you, you just had a gift, man, for the way that you were able to, to bounce the chords around rather than just, you know, straight strum. I mean, it was it made it difficult on me you know, to get the rhythm right. but. What a what a great sound you created. Well, it was I don't know when when we that, that was just the second song I ever wrote and wrote it for the our first recording session. You're bragging now, right? No, well, <laughs> and, but, but it's part of the story, really, because yeah. the thing is, um, we were so young and naive right. that when our producer said you guys could always write something for the session, I went away and wrote something. Chris White, our bass player, went right. away and, and wrote something, right. and and. You know, I was full, full of the arrogance and naivety of youth and thinking that nothing could go wrong. You know, I, ha I had no knowledge of any pitfalls. I just thought that anything that you did would be presented in the best possible way. The recording would be fabulous. That anything that I'd written, Colin would sing absolutely beautifully. And the yeah, harmonies right. would sound great. I know, it was just cra it was crazy, yeah. really. And unbelievably, with, with, with all that feeling that only comes once, um, it all happened. And... And then it came out, and of course it was a huge, huge record everywhere. But um, the thing was, many, many years later, I just thought we were being the Beatles in inverted commas, really. You know, we were just making our song and just doing that in a very straight ahead, rock and roll sort of way. But I had a love for many different sorts of music, including classical music, but also jazz. There was a great jazz scene at that time. Around, when I got, first of all, interested in rock and roll in around 1956, it was a great time for jazz as well. And the Miles Davis band with Coltrane, mm -hmm. and Cannibal Adderley, and, and a bit later Bill Evans, and you know, all these guys, all that was going on. And that sunk into my brain as well. I never thought we were using any of it, but um, somehow in the recesses, it was there. And many years later, when I saw Pat Metheny, and he was introduced to me, and I didn't think he knew who I was, but he said, Rod Argent, you wrote She's Not There. I said, yeah, oh, thank you. you know. He said, oh man, that modal stuff, it was just, he said, it, it, it gave me a way ahead, I thought, to do what I wanted to do, with fusing jazz and, 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 and rock music, you right. know. Yeah. Um, and I thought, I thought, I said, well, thank you very much. But I went away and I thought, there's, there's nothing modal about She's Not There. But I went home and I played the chords. And what I was thinking of as just being an A minor seventh to a D seventh right. chord, um, I'd actually, constructed a modal phrase over it without thinking. It was purely unconscious. And I think some of those influences, and then, you know, being full of also sort of arrogance as well, what I wanted to, to play all the time. And I always wanted to solo on everything that we did. Well, I you know? and that was one thing that was so unique too about you guys, was it was not a guitar solo, it was, it was keyboard. So. But I really came unstuck with that because on all the early TV programs we used to do, um, None of the cameramen understood that 
a keyboard player could take the solo. Right. So I would have my big moment, you know, <laughs> the camera been on Colin, you know, right. no one told me about it, and all this. And then we'd have the harmonies, and occasionally, if we were lucky, we got a glimpse of camera. And then I zoomed into my solo, and the camera would go on the drums. <laughs> or, or somebody, but <laughs> anyone but <laughs> Anyone but the anyone keyboard player. Right. Right. So, you, you know, so that... that uh, it didn't always work for me being a keyboard player. No, you don't. Uh, you did that. In, is it true you did that in one take? Tell her, tell her no. Or she's uh, not no, there. She's not there. there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when we we did several takes, but for First instance, the, the solo were, was was different on every take. I've heard some of the outtakes, and we were, we truly used to improvise. You know, it wasn't like yeah. we would work out something and set it. It was always improvised, but it was very quick, wasn't oh, it? it was you would have really done the, vocal, the lead vocal in, and we used to do. We only had four tracks, as you know, in those right. days. Mm. So Colin would have a track to himself. Um, with the backing harmonies. Oh, with the backing harmonies. Yeah, we, oh, so it was fixed. Yeah. So, you know, those, yeah. the four tracks fixed the, the, the balance that you got. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, so it would have been two or three takes. Oh, it would have been really, really quick. I, th I think we did four or five tunes in that first e e evening yeah. that we were in there. Yeah. But, you know, I was just going to say about Rod's writing, it's, one of the reasons it's, it's so clever is that it sounds simple, and it it is easy to play nearly correctly. But if you want to play it correct, right. really correctly, and make it sound good, it's not simple. I know. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And, and it's one of the reasons why I don't really enjoy playing so much with other people right. because they never get it quite right. right. And then it doesn't sound as good yeah. as if it was played properly. But some of those chords, especially for guitarists, yeah. Rob being a keyboard player, you know, he plays these huge, great chords. Yeah. And the, the guitarist is just playing a straight A minor or something into D. And, uh, and it, it, it just doesn't work, you know. I, I, I ran into that problem. You know, yes. Trying to, trying, to, trying to copy it there. But I, I, for some reason, I was under the impression though, that y'all did one take on that. And, and one reason I was thinking that, y'all wanted, did you win a contest or something and have Yes, a, we won a big rock competition. And so you had a recording deal from that, right? Yeah, I think it was only for one single originally. Um, and we recorded, I think, four tracks yeah. in, uh, in the first evening. I'll just say very quickly, because we, we did a talk this morning, and I told this story this morning, but this is our first session in a commercial studio, and it was in the evening. And the engineer, who was a very good engineer, but he'd been at a wedding all day. And when we arrived, he was absolutely drunk. Mm. And he was very aggressive mm. as well. And so I've been in the business 60 years. But after 30 minutes, I thought this business is not for me. Because we've got the headphones on. Huh? He was swearing and shouting at us down the headphones. It was really uncomfortable. And then we had a bit of luck. And he passed out cold. And we carried him out. One zombie on each arm and one zombie on each leg, leg. Three flights of stairs into the back of a black London taxi. <laughs> and we never saw him again. So he was carried away by zombies. He was carried away by zombies. Yeah, zombies and never seen again. And that was how our that was how our recording session started. And his assistant took over. But that was that was she's not there, right? That was she's, she's not, not there. there. Yeah. His assistant took over, just a young kid sitting yeah. in the corner. It was Gus Dudgeon, uh -huh. who went on to produce all of Elton's early albums, David Bowie, yeah. Kiki D, many, many people. Yeah. And that was Gus Dudgeon's first session, and it was our first session. And Gus is no longer with us now, but he never forgot that first session. But it nearly didn't happen because the engineer was steaming, yeah. absolutely steaming. Yeah. You know, I was, talking to, uh, I was talking to Robbie Krieger, and his first song was um, Light My Fire. Yeah. That was the first song he wrote. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And he, I, again, it was just go home and write a song, you know, yeah. and that's what he came back with. I remember we only had two weeks, so I thought, well, I've got, I've got two weeks to do this, and the band's got to rehearse it, you know, and we've got to get to it, and they've got to like it and everything. So um, I just put on what albums I had, and I just bought a John Lee Hooker album. Oh. and. And there was the first track on side one, and I don't want to get sued for this, but was a song called No One Told Me. Now, yeah. I hasten to add that that one phrase was the only thing that I had in common with that, except I just had it in my head that I wanted to start with, uh, um, melodically, a blues scale. Yeah. So I wanted to start with a blues scale. So, you know, no one told me about her, the way she lied, no one told me about her, how many people cried. And then I wanted the second set section to go into three-part harmony, 
um, with the lower part not being the bass note of the chord. So we always had it in our head not just to do thirds, you know, uh, that, that many people did, and many people made it sound wonderful. I mean, look at the Everest, for God's sake. Yeah. Um, but, um, and then building to a climax, because it's in a minor key, then building to a climax um, just on one note, but with a constantly changing rhythm, and ending on a major chord, and then coming right back down again to a minor blues scale. That was, that was what was in my head. And I started with No One Told Me and just started to weave a story around that. That's how that song was written, really. And I guess it was written probably in about three or, three or four days. And then, I, and then we had our rehearsal. And actually, amazingly, it seemed to go great right from the first yeah, rehearsal. Yeah, I think, it? yeah. We all felt it was a special song. And it sounded, it sounded good right from the beginning, really. Yeah, yeah. In the front room, that's how we used yeah, to do this, wasn't it? Absolutely. And you know, what well, Rod's just reminded me about how we used to do harmonies. And I know that people who <laughs> try to work out our harmonies and they can find it really difficult and, and there's a reason for that. And it's because I was a very unschooled vocalist. And so what Rob would say to me was, especially when we got to the chorus, he would say, You sing what you think. Is the, is the main melody. And I would often take the top harmony just naturally. Right. So we do that two or three times, so that's logged in my mind. And then Chris White's got to play bass, so Rod would write him a very simple harmony. Often one note. Often <laughs> one note, yeah. which left all the other notes for Rod to feel. <laughs> right. So his harmony was often just off the scale, you know, because he's having to cover everybody else. Yeah. But that's how we did our harmonies. But most people, they'll have someone who sings the top harmony, somebody sings the bass and somebody sings the melody, but it wasn't quite like that with us. We we had to adapt to our strengths and sadly it's our, it worked, yes, yes. Yeah. our strengths yes. and sadly our weaknesses we had to adapt. Oh boy, everyone's got weaknesses. Yeah. The, the, something that kind of struck me is your your writing and um, on those songs was kind of reminded me of the guy, he was here not long ago. Um, Jay, what was the guy that wrote um, Bus Stop? Oh, Graham Gorman. Oh, yeah. So it, it, um, your songwriting reminded me of, of Graham and, and because, uh, the same kind of a feel. I mean, his. Okay. Uh, I mean, For Your Love. Yeah, yeah. Um, heart, heart Full of Soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was just, it, I, th I think that you, you guys could have done those songs. It, too, you know. I mean, yeah. There, there was there's there's some kind of a kindred spirit to those songs. Well, there to was me. a lot. There was a lot of common influences going on in the UK, and it was strange because we didn't have a radio network like you guys have always had here. So there wasn't ever records played constantly from morning till night. Mm. We had the BBC that had a strict needle time policy. So. I remember that just being, what, two record programmes a week. It was a half an hour in the middle of the week and a half yeah. an hour, you know, at the end of the week. It was crazy, really. The Musicians' Union was very strong. Yeah. And they had lots of orchestras playing light orchestral music. Yeah. And, and because the union was so strong, they wouldn't allow records to be played except for one or two oh, wow. short programmes a week. And this would have been true when the Beatles were successful. Uh, I think so, 64. That was yeah. before, was it, were the pirates around then? The, the, the pirates started in 64. Okay, so because uh, the BBC was so strict about the needle time, these pirate ships started up. I was going to ask you when did that UK. start? Yeah, yeah, it was because around that, with really enthusiasts manning yeah. the yeah. ships. And so they knew about the music and they were fanatical about the music. That they were, so you got this real a contact with the audience and it wasn't big business doing it yeah it was these guys right but what it did mean is that when the beatles started which was a, 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 they had their huge explosion a couple of years before you guys did it was 64 over here really mm -hmm. for them but it was 62 in the uk and um because they came from liverpool all the seamen it was a huge port so they would come back and they would get records from across all the genres yeah. in New York and yeah. bring them back. Right. And, that, and that was the music that would seep out. That's how they discovered Motown. Right. Motown became really big. Even the old country blues artists, yes. you know, like Muddy Waters right. and John Lee Hooker, I mentioned already. Um, and, and sometimes the, the jazz things that were going on. And we were amazed when we came over here and we would go into a club 
and see someone like Roland Kirk, who we thought was, had nearly godlike status in, yeah. in the UK. And I remember going to see them, and Chris White uh, and I, and it, it might have been, were you there I was as well? There, yeah. You were there as well. And a dr- one other drunk couple, that was the audience. And wow. this guy was playing, you know. And I thought, this is crazy. But what it meant was we had a cross fertilization of genres going right. on. Right. And, and all the early rockers that, w- that were lucky enough to be 18 or so in 19 or 19 in 1964 um, had all these merging influences coming on us at the same time. And we were amazed when we came over to the States and did our first tour that I remember being in Nashville and, and we were speaking to a couple of girls that we met there. And she was saying, uh, the girl that I met was saying something to me like, um, oh, I've never heard that record. I said, you must have heard it. It's, it's, it's nearly at the top of the charts. But it was a race record, you know. It's, yeah. So she would only hear the white artists. Right, right. And never the black. And of course, Elvis and, and Buddy yes. Holly and yeah. cross those genres. Well, I was going to say that I really kind of got my first taste of blues from the animals, you know. Hey, we're yeah. going to take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum Backstage fans. Check out our new backstage gear. From t-shirts to coffee mugs, we've got you covered. Not yet a fan? Check out our YouTube channel and enjoy some intimate conversations with the world's best musicians. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage with the Zombies, Colin Blonstone and Rod Argent. We were talking in the break. I think it's kind of an interesting story. Um, you're, both you guys are big Elvis fans. I mean, who wasn't really, you know? Yeah. But that's really was a major influence for you, for you and for you to you know, start with. To yeah. start with. Oh man, you got a great surprise later in life. I did. I, I really did. It, it was uh, just, just quickly. The, the guy that turned me on to rock and roll was my cousin Jim Rodford, who was with the Kinks for yeah. 15 years on their biggest ever selling records, and and was an, always a mentor to me. He, he lived 400 yards away from me. His mum and mine were best friends you know so I'd always look up to him and when I was 11 I went down to his house and I I didn't really like the popular music very much at the time I listened to it it was things like Perry Como and the very easy listening type of thing and he said and he'd started a skiffle group and one of the very first ones in the in the whole of, of the south of England mm-hmm. and he said oh I've got a couple of things to play you I said yeah yeah okay and so he played me a couple of Bill Haley records and I said yeah it's okay you know it's okay he said, well, let me play you this. And he played me Hound Dog. And man, my whole world was turned around. And to my parents' horror, I, I went back up and I didn't want to hear anything but the rawest rock and roll that I could lay my hands on uh, for the next six months, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, early Little Richard records. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, um, Jerry Lee Lewis. But also, uh, very quickly, led me into the pathways of, of listening to black music that, mm-hmm. that I had never heard, the rhythm and blues and mm-hmm. blues. Uh, and this happened to so many people in, in the UK. It was, it was a, a universal influence on the early things. So really what you got out of the English players was like a mix of Motown, but with some of these early things thrown in, yeah. and, and, and all, you know, which is what made the English filter make it sound slightly different. Anyway, the very first gig we did in America was the Murray the K show in 1964. Right. Yeah. Uh, Christmas show, and we 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 played just after Patti LaBelle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and we were scared stiff. We thought five skinny white kids from from England, and um, they're going to hate us. They're going to think we're just playing their music in a watered down fo- mm. form. But they didn't hear it that way at all. Mm. They heard it as as having gone through the English filter mm-hmm. and having something that they really identified with. They were absolutely lovely to us. Anyway, I was telling all this story to this Irish DJ about 30 years later. And I was saying, when I first saw Elvis, um, you know, because I was knocked out with his records, and then I saw uh, one of his early TV clips Mm -hmm. that that were just shown on UK TV. You know, it was probably 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And I just was transfixed, you know, and I thought, this is, I've I've got to be part of this music when I'm old enough, you know. I was only 11 or 12, but I've got to be part of this music as soon as I can form a band, I have to form a band. But, um, uh... We came over in 64, and I was telling all this story to um, this particularly Irish DJ, and he, st- and he stopped me, and I said, but I felt we could never do that. And, and he said, I can't believe you didn't know this, 
He said, but in 1964 and 65, Elvis had three, he said, I'm an Elvis freak. He said, Elvis had three of your songs and the Zombies records on his jukebox. And I thought, oh man, I, I was completely, you know, I mean, I'm talking 20 to the dozen at the moment, yeah. but I was completely <laughs> lost for the words, you know. I well, really couldn't say anything. It's life's it's full circle, you know. Man. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's nice to know that, that the person that influenced you, you influenced them yeah. in, in a way too, you know. You know, we were in, we were in Memphis doing an interview, just, just like this. Yeah. Um, it was probably about 65 or 66. And the DJ said to us, uh, do you want to go and see Elvis afterwards? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's such a strange thing to he say. Said, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, okay. We, we said, yeah. So we walked up to Graceland. There was no security right. whatsoever. And we walked up the drive. We knocked on the door. Yeah. And we're not sure if it was his father. I think it was Vernon, actually. Or his uncle. I don't know. It was someone came to the door. And he said, you know, all oh, the zombies. Elvis would have loved to have met you. I said, but he's in Hawaii filming at the moment, oh, so we, well, you know, right. you can't meet him. But he, he said, you know, have a look around, make yourselves at home. And so we spent an hour or so in, in Graceland. And, and we thought he didn't know us at all, didn't we? Yeah. We thought he was just, this was sudden hospitality, you know, at its best. Well, remember, I mean, I was here. Y'all were huge. You still are huge. You know, I mean, the, the, the uh, your music didn't, it doesn't sound dated. It sounds as good or better to me, and I think the people that Thank you. originally heard you, Thank you know, you. and and of course your voice. Um, I don't even feel qualified to to say anything about it because it's just I'm not a singer uh, in any shape, form, or fashion. But you're, you you have uh, you've heard other people say it. I guess they just say it, the airiness of your voice, maybe or something. But it's so unique, you know, that you know it's you. When you hear it, unlike so many people you today, do. you don't know who you're actually yeah, listening to. Yeah, it's got to. its own stamp. And you should hear his voice on the album we've just completed. It sounds fantastic. Yeah. And, and we're getting a huge um, reaction on, on this. I mean, it won't be coming out for a little while because of scheduling. It's only just finished, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. I'm just thinking back on watching you guys on, on TV, and I, I'm not sure what, what shows I saw you on, but... Um, Very few, actually. Uh, but, man, I, and I could be also, you know, I watched the videos all the time mm. that, that were on whatever shows that you guys did. What was the show that you guys did where, um, um, obviously, you're out front, but you're standing, you're, you're sitting, ne like, next to a truck or something, and... I think it was at that Hippodrome thing we did, but Jack Jones was introducing it. It had the, uh, the the sculpture of Mozart or something. Oh, that's right, yeah. What was that show called? Hullabaloo, wasn't it? Hullabaloo. Oh, Hullabaloo, yeah. I got the H right. Oh, was yeah. it Hullabaloo? I think Hullabaloo. It, Hullabaloo. Yeah. it was the first Hullabaloo ever. Really? It was the first show. And Jack Jones was the compere. Right now, I'd like you to meet some people. What is your name, please? Rodney Terrence Argent. Hugh Birch Grundy. Paul Ashley Warren Atkinson. Christopher Taylor White. Colin Edward Michael Blunston. You probably know them better as the zombie. And we just mimed what one song. Oh, they tried to get us to do a dance sequence. At the end, and, and with the people from West Side Story, for God's uh -huh. sake. These wonderful dancers. And oh. they, they thought we'd just pick it up, but they, they had to cut that bit because yeah. we couldn't do I it. Was, yeah. I, was, I was moving badly opposite the guy who exploded you know, action yeah. in, in West Side Story. Yeah. And that was a film which, in a different way, sort of changed my life as well. I was 15 when I saw it. Wow. And I thought, this is the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Chris Isaacs has one of my favorite records ever, is Wicked Games, and the, and the video as well it was, was, was awesome, is awesome. And the girl that's in the video acts like she could care less about him, you know, while, I mean, you know, while he's holding her and all that stuff, and she's looking around and looking at her fingernails and everything. It was, and it's something a little bit appealing about a girl that's not just, you know, doing the back it up thing, you know, <laughs> you know, where they've got some class. And you guys had that, that those girls that were on them, they were like, you know, 
almost statuettes like they were. Yeah, they were right, very yeah, much yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, just they stood completely to, uh, still. And incidentally, they never spoke to us once. Really? And I think we were rehearsing that show for three days, and they never even, well, didn't speak to me anyway. Not well, maybe they one. weren't active. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they just, they're just like, you know, unfazed, like, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and there was a certain appeal to yeah, that, yeah, I thought, yeah. a lot, you know. And because the song is kind of a haunting, longing kind of a... Mm. Record, you know, it has a mood about it. It does, it? yeah. Like a, a remote and, sort of and, mood. And tell her no too. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. to me, you know. So anyway, yeah, you're, you're writing, you're singing. It was a perfect recipe, in my Thank opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we're going to take one more break, and we'll come back in just one minute. The Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum has been celebrating the men and women who make the music of our lives since 2006. The Musicians Hall of Fame is the one and only museum in the world that honors the musicians that played on the greatest recordings of all time. It's a music city, huh? It's, uh, I mean, where else are you going to get the cats, all the cats that are in this room? From Hank to Hendrix, from L.A. to Nashville, the Musicians Hall of Fame will take you on a musical journey highlighting the talented musicians that created the soundtrack of our lives. Come see what you've heard, and while visiting, check out the interactive Grammy Museum Gallery at the Musicians Hall of Fame, located in the heart of downtown Nashville in the first floor of the historic Nashville Municipal Auditorium. See you soon at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with the zombies again, Colin Bronstone and Rod Orden. So when you got to the States, what your, your first show was Murray Murray, Murray the Kane in 64 yeah and then what happened I mean what what was where did you play what kind of what kind of venues did you play we, we just on that first show it was just at the Brooklyn Fox it was one theater and we were on with um Patti LaBelle on the Blue Bells we were on with um Benny King and the Drifters yeah, Dion Warwick, Dion Shang Warwick. Shangri Las. They were like fourteen acts, mm -hmm. and, um, and we did uh, two songs, didn't we? Yeah, everyone would do one or two songs. And then they made us dance. Everybody in the back. When you finished your song, you had to go in a line at the back. And <laughs> dance <laughs> behind everybody. Which was never our strong suit. As dancers, we we weren't going to make it. No. How did you? How did you? How could you afford to come over here? And just do one gig. To well, well, no, we no had it was for ten days. This was ten days. Uh, so we did yeah. um, the. Murray the K uh, Christmas show at the Brooklyn Fox for 10 days and then we did that hullabaloo TV show and at, from memory with the TV show tacked on the end we broke even. And we, we later found out that in the years that we were professional the two writers, myself and Chris White, mm -hmm. were always fine for money because we had very honest publishers yeah. and we had more hits around the world than we ever realised at the time because in those days it was, the world was a big place, yeah. and you could have a hit in Guatemala and never know about it, you know. You could have a hit at the North Pole now, and you'd know within three hours that yeah. you, you got a hit, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, so, but that's why the band broke up in the first place, really, because the guitarist was getting married, he said, I've got no money, you know. Yeah. And, and we just broke even in spite of having a lot of record success and a lot of headline touring successful. We were ripped off. We later learned from someone in the same organization many, many years later. He said, oh, he was at a dinner with Chris Wyatt and he said, I had nothing to do with what that first, you know, how you were paid. And Chris thought, well, I didn't ask you if you did. Yeah. You know, he was obviously had a real guilty conscience. Yeah. He said, you were ripped off to the tune of two million pounds. And that was That's in, in the in 60s. The 60s. Yeah. So uh, it'd be uh, like uh, 20 or 30 huge million. Of money. Yeah. And, and, um, and that's why, really, we, we felt we had to break up. From the writing, it was fine, but from the, the actual performing level, we, we didn't lose money, but we ended up just breaking even. So you didn't, you didn't do any large uh, stadium or, or auditorium? We did, but with a... With a Usually with other people. With we, other did people. Dick yeah. 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 we did the Dick Clark. We did the Dick Clark Caravan Stars. Right, we did right. with Del Shannon. Tom, yeah, Tommy. they used to do those upstairs, so they'd do the Dick Clark Caravan and yeah. Yeah. Caravan well, Stars. We, we may well have played here, you know, I, I, I can't I think, remember. Then, you know, I think we did. I think there's one of you, they have a lot of the tickets from upstairs. Wow. Blown mm. up and they go around the, the, the perimeter of the auditorium. Maybe, I mean, maybe Tom Petty, who was a lifelong fan, said the very first show he ever saw in his life 
was at Jacksonville, and we were on the bill. Yeah. Um, and he, he could still quote every song that we did yeah. on that show and, and how each part of the song affected him, you know. I'm a, I'm a huge, huge Tom Petty fan. Mm. And, I, and I have serious radio, basically, to, for Tom Petty radio, and, and, he, and he did play Zombies all, Did he? All the time, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. And, and talked about you guys. And he always actually, wrote beautifully about us, but I, I, I love the fact that in the last year of his life, we got a lot closer to him, and then we, 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 he had us up to his house, and we spent an oh, afternoon great. with him, you yeah. know. And it was lovely. And, yeah, I, and, and he I'm recorded so part glad. of his show up there, with, so we went up to his house and into his studio. And yeah, yeah. Recorded all part afternoon. Of, yeah, yeah. It was, it was great. Yeah, yeah he, was, he seemed like, I, I, I hate that I didn't meet. I met, I met, um, Mike Campbell, the guitar player, who was an awesome guitar player, by the way, but um, I never got a chance to... Uh, I, well, I was backstage one time, but I, did, I didn't want to bother him. I didn't, didn't say anything, but I always kind of wish I had her now, you know. There was one great moment when we, we, we supported him at Jackson Hole in this incarnation of the Zombies, mm -hmm. and it must have been, what, about 2008 or 2009, mm -hmm. something yeah, like that. Yeah. And um, the band were on stage, on Tom Petty's, you know, and we were all lined up on the side of the stage waiting to w watch him. And um, they were all playing the intro music before mm. Tom was coming running on. And he came running on, and then he saw us on the side of the stage. And he turned around, and he started having a conversation with us. And he was talking to us for about five minutes, and we said, Tom, I think you ought to get on <laughs> <Yes>. the stage. <laughs> well, he was really loved. That's what I loved about him. And, and he, what he loved, I, I, we were close to the same age, and... We listened to the same music pretty much. He listened to more. He listened to more race music than I did. I mm -hmm. didn't really get into that until after, like I said, until, I, until the until you guys brought it back with, you know, like the animals and bands like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, but uh, you know the the same the the Yardbirds the the same influences you know mm -hmm. and uh, but he was a true. He was a fan. A lot of times, you know, I found that. A lot of the the people that that we all are in awe of are in awe of each other is more so than even just a regular non-playing fan mm, because yeah. because the musicians realize just how good the other one is yeah and it's not just a fanboy thing it's it's like a respect for of your abilities you know kind of a thing you know? we got to mention Al Al Cooper I mean yeah absolutely yeah so we inducted Al. Uh, in I think it was 2008, and 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 that's when I that's I did not know this until he told me that he was when he was working at CBS. Uh, uh, the the last album. Uh, Odyssey, 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 Odyssey and Oracle, Oracle. yeah. That CBS were going to pass on it, and yeah. uh, his first Monday morning. It's really brave of him, really. It was his first day in at CBS, and he went up to Clive Davis probably the most powerful guy in the record industry. And he said, Clive, I've just come back from London. I, had, I bought 200 albums and one album stood out. And, and he, he showed him this album and he said, whatever it costs, we have to get this album. And Clive Davis said to him, we own that album, but we were going to pass on it. We weren't even going to issue it. But Al talked him into issuing Odyssey and Oracle. But I think even then, I don't think Clive was, was convinced. Option, yeah, I, I, and we came out on a subsidiary. We weren't on CBS. Was it Date Records? I think. I think, it was, I think it was Date. Yeah. And, and and then they released either three or four singles. Oh, it might be Epic. Oh, I can't remember. Epic was is, is it Columbia and Epic were. Epic yes, but I think Epic was a little a little later. Ar Argent okay. were on Epic, and oh, yeah. actually I was on Epic too. Um, but they released two or three singles, and nothing happened. So so far. Uh, there's nothing happening with this album at all. And then Al convinced uh, Clive to release Time of the Season. It wasn't the first single. Which he didn't want to do. No. Clive didn't want to release And uh, so Al convinced him to release that. And there was one DJ in Boise, Idaho. Idaho. Yeah. Boise, Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And uh, he would not stop playing it. And it just spread from him. It took months it took and months. six months at least. Yeah, for it to be a hit. But the, the album was very nearly... Uh, not released, and now um, Rolling Stone has named it as one of the top 100 oh, albums yeah. of, of all time. Right. I, and That's you think, a great album. I yeah. Love it, yeah. And, and it, think, it hasn't stopped selling. Yeah. Uh, and we get young kids all the time coming yeah. up to us who, who've just heard it and just bought it. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about 17, 18 year olds, yeah. you know. 
and young young um, independent bands are, are always coming to our concerts yeah. and coming back and talking. So we owe so much to Al Cooper. That album would never have been released in no. America yeah. without that. And that was that was your biggest. It was. Record, wasn't it? it was time of the season. Yeah. Funnily enough, do you know time of the season was never a hit in the UK. I think it's been released. It's about the only country. Yeah, I think it's been released three times. Time of the season in the UK. It's never been a hit, but it was our worldwide. It's our biggest hit. And record. yet, even the young younger generation in the UK know it. Yeah. And we play Glastonbury, and you have to get your own audience. There's lots of bands going on stages all the time. Mm -hmm. And when we this was what, how many years ago? Can't that five or six years ago? Mm -hmm. Something like that. And uh, we started in one of the smaller venues. You mm -hmm. know, it, it held in the end about four or five thousand total in, in that. So it wasn't one of the huge things. And uh, when we started, I thought, oh, God, we're going to be playing to nobody. But it very quickly filled up. And it was great. And we had a really good audience. And when we played Time of the Season, it erupted. And I thought, how do you young guys know this? Because it, it was never hit in well, England. Well, hadn't it been in a lot of TV? And yeah, yeah it it's has. been in a lot of films. It's yeah. never stopped, yeah. actually. Yeah. And that's, that's really, a, a, when you get in a film... You know, it's, it, yeah. it just really changes everything. It has. Yeah. And, and radio, actually, strangely enough, in, in the UK, have never stopped playing it. I mean, they don't play it on heavy rotation, but they've never stopped playing well, it. Well, you know, of course, now with Sirius and everything, you know, mm. it's on all the time. Oh, Sirius yeah. XM is great. I wish yeah. we had something like that. Yeah. And, and, uh, cause I, it, I was in the 60s, Sirius and Tom Petty, mm. the most of, of the two of the stations I listened to on there. So then, uh, um, Arjun, how did, how did that happen? Arjun happened because when, when um, the zombies split up in that first incarnation in 1967, actually, um, Chris White and I, who were the two writers, mm -hmm. we wanted to keep going in the business. And everyone else had had enough, quite understandably, because they felt they were, that we'd been ripped off mm -hmm. and we'd had all this success and we hadn't got any money from that side of things at all. So I can understand that. So everyone moved into different areas. Um, Paul Atkinson went in uh, as an executive in, in um, uh, the record company mm -hmm. uh, industry. Um, and so did Hugh Grundy for a while. Um, but Chris and I immediately uh, formed a production company. And we had two projects in our head. One was to form my second band, which was Argent. So we went about finding some players, um, including my cousin, who, I'd, who turned me on to Elvis all those years mm -hmm. ago in 1955. Um, and the other project we had, had in the head was to do an album that we produced because Chris and I had produced uh, Odyssey and Oracle mm -hmm. and, and, and for the first time we felt we got the songs sounding like, like we wanted them to mm -hmm. and we had the same vision for Colin really because we thought it was hugely talented as we still do you know mm -hmm. and we wanted to present him in a way that we felt was right so we wanted to uh, record one year because it took a that was the one that took a year to... And luckily, time of the season reached number one <laughs> on the cash box, number two or three in Billboard. And um, we went over to the States, had a meeting with Clive Davis, and we were in the perfect position because we had the number one record that we produced right. and um, from an album that we produced. Uh, and we said we wanted to do these two things, and we immediately were given the go-ahead. Yeah. And... Um, They've both retained a cult uh, status, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, the first two Argent albums that, that we did, in some ways, I think, were a natural progression from the Zombies. And in some ways, they're my favourite albums. But we recorded them in a very new, very small studio. And it had a rather small sound. And, uh, and that always bugged me. And that's why we then moved to Abbey Road mm. to get a bigger sound. And that's when we recorded Hold Your Head Up oh, and Keep On Rolling, yeah. that was the, the B side to that. Um, but interestingly, Sony, about six or seven years ago, released an Argent compilation. And those first two albums they had remastered. And with modern, modern uh, mastering technology, with multi band compression, mm -hmm. you can bring up the levels of the. Uh, of the frequencies that are missing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of bass. Right. You know, if it's a bit bass light, you can bring that up there and you can compress it in that way but without messing up everything else. Mm -hmm. And then you can maybe bring up the snare. Anyway, the, the result was that suddenly the material and the playing that were on those first two Argent albums could compete 
sonically right. with everything else that's around here. Yeah. And they sounded fabulous. Yeah. And I thought, if they'd have been recorded like that, I think those two albums would have been hits at the time. But, but they weren't. And then, sadly, Sony then stopped producing that box set. And, and now the only place you can get it is on, on the internet and on Amazon. And, and it'll cost you about £300, you know, to get yeah. a copy. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was very interesting. But, in, but then we did have a, a couple of very big hits, and, and Hold Your Head Up was huge. It was huge, yeah. All over the world. Yes, you know? yeah. So that was cool. Yeah. So how many dates are you guys doing now, a year, every, not just in the States, but around the world? Are you? Oh, oh. We're, we're, we're touring constantly, but not for the last two years. It's been, yeah, it's been very yeah. difficult, you know, yeah. but up until then, we, we, tour, we are a touring yeah. band. You know, we tour all the time. So we're doing a tour of the States now. And I think, one. yeah, we're doing another one in the summer, and then we're doing one of Scandinavia and Germany and Austria. Holland in in the autumn, which will pretty much take us to the end of the year. But we're already booked for the first part of next year as well. So um, we have we, to keep reminding our management how old we're getting. <laughs> actually. Well, yeah, we're getting a bit frail like said, for this, the, you know. The, the music is timeless. I mean, it really does not sound. A lot of music, you know, sounds dated. You know, the productions and. I can't wait to give you our new album because I can't wait to hear it. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, it won't come out for you know several months because uh -huh. of all the things that you have to. It's only just been mastered, uh -huh. but it's had a fantastic reaction from the people who heard it That's so far. Cool. No, I can understand that. Well, again, uh, I just uh, it's been a real pleasure to it's a pleasure to meet you, George. guys, and great and, uh, to meet you again, too. I'm just uh, I've been a fan since you guys hit the radio over here, and. Uh, I will continue to be as long as I'm here. Oh, come on. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough. So thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame backstage, and we'll see you next time.